Hi everyone, I thought I'd make a video about ECU grounding because I've seen a lot of debate about the best way to ground ECUs and I thought I'd explain some of the theory because a lot of it's not all that difficult to understand. However, it is complex with several separate considerations and when you see how they interact, you'll see that there is actually one optimal solution that works for almost all cases. But my point here is not to tell people how to do it. The point is to actually encourage people to analyze systems properly. First of all, I'm going to talk about the two main problems that we're trying to avoid, how to analyze them and optimize the ground layout for each of these considerations. The two main problems are ground offsets due to common impedance paths and magnetic field noise. Ground offsets are not very well understood, which is a bit of a missed opportunity because they're actually very easy to visualize once you draw a diagram. To analyze the system for ground offsets, first you need to draw a diagram of the system. Then remember that each wire has resistance, so you're going to see a voltage drop across the wire from one end to the other, depending on how much current's flowing through it and in what direction. Since we're talking about grounding in the context of ECUs, we're going to look at voltages from the ECU's perspective and predict what can go wrong if we have voltage drops. So imagine this first example. The installer has grounded the ECU to the engine and also to the battery because he was told that was a good idea and more grounds are always good. You might ask, why would anyone do that? But this is the sort of thing that I see. Now during cranking, there's a lot of current that flows between the engine and the battery to power the starter motor. So that means that there's going to be a voltage drop between the engine and the battery negative. So because there's a voltage drop and there's some resistance on the grounding cables that go to the ECU, there's going to be a current induced in those ECU ground wires. Exactly how much current depends on the starter motor current and also the ratio of the resistance between the grounding strap and the ECU grounds. So if you've got a good grounding strap for the starter motor, then there's probably not going to be much voltage drop. But if the connection's a bit corroded or it's a bit loose or something like that, then before you know it, you can blow up the ECU. So obviously this is a bad situation. This second example is actually what I have used in the past to interview technical support engineers. So I guess this is being public now, so I'm going to have to pick a different example to test people. But anyway, it's actually a mistake made by Mazda in the factory loom for the NA6 MX5 or Miata. They fixed it on the following model, which is the 1.8 litre. The sensor ground is actually externally connected to the engine. The sensor ground should only be connected to the ECU, but Mazda connected it to the engine as well. The ECU power ground is also connected to the engine. We know that as the injector duty cycle increases, the average ground current of the ECU also increases because the ECU is grounding the injectors. So the ECU is going to be sitting at a slightly higher voltage than the actual engine ground. So any sensor that's grounded to the engine rather than to the ECU, or if it's grounded to both, then the resistance of the sensor ground is going to be much higher than the connection to the engine ground. So we can understand the sensor just to be grounded at the engine. So if we pick an example, coolant temperature, that's grounded to the engine, which means that the higher the injected duty cycle becomes, the higher the ground voltage at the ECU is relative to the engine and therefore the lower voltage the ECU reads off the coolant temperature sensor. So the ECU actually thinks that the engine's hotter as the injector duty cycle increases. And this is fairly easy to spot in logs. You can see the coolant temperature jumping around as the injectors turn on and off. And at higher RPM and higher loads, you can see a general increase in the coolant temperature as measured. But obviously it causes problems. Now I'll give you a third example, which is where we have a coil on plug ignition system. In this case, the coils are grounded to the engine, but the installer wanted to ground the ECU to the battery instead. Now as the engine speed increases, the alternated charge current, which is going back to the battery, also increases. And if we assume that the grounding between the ECU and the battery is also not the best, that means that the voltage drop between the ECU and the battery is going to increase as injector duty cycle increases. So that means we have a double bad effect where the ECU ground is going to sit substantially higher than the actual ground at the engine. And if the coil on plugs are grounded at the engine, then that means that when the ECU out ignition output is off, that is when it's driving low, when the coil's not supposed to be being fired, that's going to sit at a higher voltage than zero because the ECU's ground is not the same as engine ground. Now, with some ignition coils, they only need about 0.7 of a volt to actually trigger the internal transistor to switch them on. So you don't need a lot of ground voltage offset before it actually starts to cause a problem. Now, if it causes a problem and turns the ignition coil on, and then it comes back down and turns the ignition coil off again, then you're going to get a spark at, it could be at any angle because it's not synchronized with the engine rotation. Now, obviously this is going to cause sparks at bizarre angles, and on a fragile engine like a rotary, it can actually kill it very quickly. This is how important ground hygiene is. Now, in all the examples I just gave, the problem is common impedance parts. So where you have a single wire or path, if you like, where multiple currents are flowing, and they're going to cause voltage offsets. Each one's going to cause its own voltage offset and that's going to confuse the other ones that share that same path. Now, the way around this, as audio installers and electrical engineers would know, is to use star point earthing. 
say you select a single point to be your earth or ground and you ground everything back to that point. So for what I've described so far, it doesn't really matter so much whether that point is the engine or the battery or whatever, um, so long as it's the same for everything, it has to refer to a ground. Now, I'm not talking about sensor grounds here because if you connect the sensor grounds back to that point, then you're going to have the common impedance path problem. So sensor grounds should be grounded to the sensor ground output of the ECU. But I'm talking about where do we ground the ECU and ignition coils and other things that draw current. Now, most sensors are completely isolated from the body. So throttle position sensors, fuel pressure, oil pressure sensors, map sensors, and so on. It coolant temp sensors for ECUs have got two wires on them. They're all isolated from the body. So they need to be grounded to the sensor ground output of the ECU. However, some sensors, such as some of the narrowband oxygen sensors and Nissan crank angle sensors, are actually grounded to their body. So that means that you don't have a choice as to where you can put the star ground at this point. It has to be the engine because that's where those sensors are going to be grounded to anyway. Generally, this is done on the inlet manifold or the head. It doesn't really matter where because the engine itself is quite thick and very low impedance, but conventionally that's where it's done. Now, the next issue that I want to discuss is magnetic field noise. Now, we all learned at school that current has to flow in a circuit, so we can visualise any current path as being a circular flow. Now, what maybe they didn't say is that when current flows in a circuit, it actually generates a magnetic field. The magnetic field gets stronger with more current that gets applied, and if you have more turns, so the loop's actually magnified multiple times, then the magnetic field becomes even stronger, and that's why solenoids, ignition coils, transformers, and so on have got lots of turns of wire in them. Now, this magnetic field actually generates electrical noise, and this is one of the two ways in which electrical noise can be generated. Uh, voltage noise is, or electric field noise is the other way. We're not going to discuss that in this talk, because magnetic is a much larger effect. There's an entire discipline on this called EMC, which is electromagnetic compatibility, where products such as ECUs and engines and that sort of thing have to conform with certain standards of how much electrical noise they're allowed to generate. It's like emissions testing for electronics. Now the main thing that determines magnetic flux, which is how much magnetism there is if you like, or how much noise is generated, is the current and the area of the loop. So the way to minimize this is to keep the loop area as small as possible. And in some installations you'll see things like wires twisted together because the loop area between those two wires is going to be very small then if they're twisted together. In ignition systems, though, you can't really do that. But let's look at what the high-voltage circuit of an ignition system looks like. So the high voltage is generated inside the ignition coil at the high-voltage terminal, and that travels down the spark lead, if there is one, to the central electrode in the plug. It then jumps the gap through the ionised air inside the chamber, and then flows out through the ground strap of the plug to the cylinder head or, or rotor housing. From there, it has to get back to the other end of the ignition coil somehow. So to minimise electrical interference, the idea is to make this area as small as possible. On most modern coils, the other side of the high voltage output coil is connected to the ground terminal of the coil. So to minimise the loop area, um, that needs to be connected to the head or the rotor housing. If you connect it back to the chassis or the battery negative, then it means that the current has to go back from the head through the grounding strap back to the battery negative and then up to the coil, which makes the loop area a lot larger. With the larger loop area, you get more magnetic interference, and that can get into things like crank angle sensor wires and cause trigger errors, but more on that later. Now, on old-style ignition coils, which just had two pins on the primary, the positive pin is the one that connects to the other side of the ignition coil. So we need a current path from our cylinder head up to the positive pin of the coil. Now, if you just installed it without understanding this, what the current path would end up being from the ignition coil positive back through the ignition switch, through fuses, and back to the battery, then from the battery negative um, back to the engine through the grounding strap. So this is obviously a very large loop and not really ideal. So what's normally done is you connect a capacitor between the positive of the ignition coil and the ground on the engine. A capacitor can think of it as being a a short circuit for high frequencies and an open circuit for low frequencies. So high frequency noise that you get from ignition systems goes straight through the capacitor and that becomes our new current path. I mentioned earlier that noise can get into the crank angle sensor wiring and cause interference and false triggers. Now this is actually a fairly complex interaction because it is actually a trigger problem but it's caused by an ignition system problem. Now it may be diagnosed at first as an ignition system problem because it is load related but that is it doesn't happen at lower loads because you don't have as much current because the ignition system doesn't work, have to work as hard 
to drop the gap in the lower pressure in the chamber. However, you may end up with trigger system errors reported by the ECU, and that would lead you to think that it's a trigger problem, which it is. Now, given that it is actually a magnetic interference getting into the trigger inputs and causing them to read incorrectly, I've seen some people say that you should rerun the wires, run them further away from ignition systems, and use shielded cable and that sort of thing. Shielded cable, unless it's a steel shield, isn't going to help a lot. The reason being that we're talking about a magnetic interference rather than electric interference. It's better than nothing and it does actually reduce the, the electric interference, but magnetic interference is usually the one that's the problem. Running it further away from the ignition leads is a good idea anyway, but often that won't get you all the way there and how do you know how much margin you have in that case anyway? The best way to determine the extent of the problem is to look at the signal on the scope and look at how big the noise is when the ignition system fires. That will tell you how much filtering you need to enable in the ECU and from there you should be able to filter out the noise. But even still, the first thing to check is that the loop area for the secondary current is as small as possible. If you look at any OEM system, that's exactly what they do. On the LS systems, the coil negatives are grounded at the head. On the S13 and SR20, the coil negatives, the coils have actually got a negative for the low voltage and a separate negative for the high voltage, and the high voltage is grounded at the head as well. And the Toyota coil unplug systems are also grounded at the head. There are other factors which will affect the amount of magnetic noise that's generated. So using non-resistor plugs instead of resistor plugs will generate more noise. A larger gap will generate more noise because you need a high voltage to cross the gap. More boost will generate more noise. And running solid leads rather than resistor leads will generate more noise as well. So these are all things that are the opposite of what's done from the factory. From factory they run resistor plugs, they run resistor leads. But obviously as you expect more from engines than what the factories do, we're going to have to change some of those. Regarding filtering and voltage thresholds, this is actually one reason why I like reluctor sensors rather than the Hall effect. Most problems occur at higher RPM when the boost is greater and the engine's producing more power. The nice thing about reluctor sensors is that the voltage that they generate increases with RPM. And therefore, even if your noise from the ignition system increases as well, the signal to noise ratio still stays pretty good. Whereas with a digital sensor, whose voltage stays the same regardless of RPM, the noise increases with RPM and the signal to noise ratio actually reduces. Now, the outcome of all this is that if you're going to use star point earthing, then you have to choose a point for the star point to be. If the ground for the high voltage of the coil is the same as the main transistor ground for the coil, then that means that that needs to be on the engine to minimise the high voltage loop area. So therefore that means that the star point needs to be at the engine rather than the battery. I'm not saying that that's where it has to be in all cases. I'm not saying that it won't work if you choose the battery instead. I'm not even trying to say to people use the engine as the star point. What I'm saying is make sure you analyze the system so that you can understand what's happening. And as a general practice, I ground to the engine just like most OEMs do because that's the one that works in almost all cases. Thank you very much.